Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here one more time, Stratford, Ontario, Canada for String Tech Workstations. So we've got two kind of oddball Gibson guitars that we're working on today. This is the Made in Canada Gibson song maker, made in Newfoundland in the former Garrison factory. And this is the 1963 J45 that came with the plastic injection molded hollow bridge. You saw that a couple of videos back. Well, we're heating up the big thick plywood bridge plate and we're going to put a 40s style solid wood, very light and very strong replacement bridge plate in there. So to remove the bridge plate, it's kind of a multi-step process. I've got two pieces of leather submerged in water. This will make a little more sense as we move along. This is the only time in Gibson's history that I can recall where they had a bolt-on neck, which pretty well everybody's gone to now. So this was the sort of transitional guitar. It's a very interesting history because this was the sort of tooling that was used for the Garrison guitars with the uh, carbon fiber skeleton and the, you know, the wood top back and sides. So it's the same neck joint. Very interesting. Interesting sort of historical footnote on Gibson's history. And that's the big deep heel joint where the threaded female inserts accept those stove bolts through the head block. It's really funny to see this. I'm, I'm intrigued. I know that, that Carla, the owner, actually thought that maybe it was a knockoff or it was a, you know, a, like a fake. <laughs> And uh, I could see why he would think that, but no, this is a genuine Gibson made in Canada. So funny to see this. And as I pointed out earlier, the, the body is super shallow. I can barely get my hand in there. So it goes from 8.3 millimeters in depth at the neck to body junction. And this central portion is 9.5. It's actually deeper than it is at the tail block. There you go, the tail block's 9 and the waist is 9.5. So with this model being the CSM or Canadian Songmaker, it's essentially the forerunner of a very popular guitar they make now called the Gibson Songwriter. So I'm giving you the best camera angle possible because I want you to see what's going on here. There's my 10 inch straight edge, but you know, it's kind of a no brainer. You can see in the camera how high that is. So I'm going to be doing something a bit unorthodox this time around. I'm going to actually remove the frets from here right up to about here. I'm going to take them out, correct the fingerboard, and reinstall the original frets. Then we'll do our fret dress. Just to make sure these frets go in exactly the same orientation they came out, I'm marking the base side with a black sharpie. So when we go to reinstall, we get them exactly where they're supposed to be. And I'll demonstrate how I use these scrub blocks that I make up for you guys in your kits. This is a very good example of how we correct the fingerboard, put the frets back in, and then we'll do our fret dress. Well, because this is an unorthodox guitar, and I really have no idea whether these frets are glued in or not, I'm just erring on the side of caution here and heating that first one up and see how that comes out. I'll be able to have a look in the saw curve now and see, and on the tang of the fret to see if it was glued or not. No glue here, and no glue in the slot. Okay, now because it's an ebony fingerboard, I'm still going to heat those frets up briefly just before I extract them.
so you can see <laughs> how much that's rocking there. So that kit that I send out to you guys is going to make more and more sense as you watch this video. This is the problem area. And that's where we're going to start. I'm going to take that uh, last piece of tape off there. Yeah, well, as you can see, I decided to take all those upper frets out. So what we're going to do is we're correcting the fingerboard and getting, getting rid of the speed bump here. And we'll start with our smallest scrub block. So I've just put some fresh 80 grit on that second smallest uh, scrub block. And we're going to take care of this. This is the worst area. This is where we're going to start. Now, I have that leather on there. This is a jointed hardwood block. But I have that leather on there, and it naturally flexes and follows the radius of the fingerboard. We're just going to work this high spot first, and we're going to take our little straight edge and kind of check it as we go. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay. Okay, we still got a little bit of fall off here, and that, that's okay. It's good to have a little bit of fall off, but it's still a little more extreme than I'd like to see. So we're continuing here with the second smallest scrub block. There's five blocks that you guys get in your kits. Let's have a look at that. Okay. Much, much better. Okay, so this is, we're talking seconds of sanding to correct this problem. Now, so this is our 80 grit. I'm, I'm hogging off some material in a hurry here. So we're going to switch over to 120 grit and a slightly longer block. There we go. Here's our 120. So we're taking the scratch marks out, obviously, of the uh, 80 grit. And we're also leveling it a little bit further. Now, if we end up with those last two frets sort of dropping off, well, that's fine. We can live with that. That's a big improvement from where it was. Okay. Take another one. And I am... I'm fine with that. So this is how I swap out the uh, sandpaper. You know, I wait until it's worn out before I swap it out. But I put that two-sided tape on there, and I'm stepping up to 180 grit just to finish off that uh, finish off that ebony fingerboard. So a quick brush with this 180 grit, and I know you know a lot of people have asked me. You know, well, how do you know if you're, you know, how do you know if you're following the radius? Well, you got to take my word for it here, people. I've been doing this for 50 years, and I have gone back and forth with the Amish, the Mennonites, and they tan this leather to the exact thickness. I get the exact flexibility I need to naturally follow that fingerboard radius. And I'm going to get a radius gauge, I'm going to measure here, and I'm going to measure there, and I'm going to show you when we're done. So I did vacuum that off again. And... Yeah, that's much better. So what we have now is the last three frets are falling off. And I'm fine with that. Just sort of checking this across the width, and it looks very good. Yep. So our fall off now is designated to the last three frets. That's where it drops off. And the rest of these frets here, up to here, are going to follow the same trajectory as the first eight frets. 
So I over radius the fret slightly. We got the black for base mark. Feels to me like there's a little bit of yeah, a little bit of debris in there. I've checked this already. I just missed this one spot. I could kind of feel it when I went to put the fret in. Just double check in here. So oh, we'll send that right back home. Beautiful. One thing about this very soft, very malleable fret wire is when it comes time to seat that overhang, it just folds right over with the tap of the hammer onto the body. Yeah, that's good. We just got through February and I can feel these frets all the way along here so we'll be doing a full edge dress and once you do that this time of year in Canada you'll never need to do it again because this is as dry as it gets. Late February the furnace has been on blasting away for months and that's about as dry as a guitar will ever get. So that's why you want to get that edge dressed now because you'll never need to do it again. Um, just check it under here to see what kind of what kind of reinforcement we got before I go tapping those frets in. Let's get in there and have a look. And I'm looking at this and big heavy head brace here. It's got a pretty heavy graft across there too. So that's good. I've got my hockey puck of uh, lead to support the soundboard while I tap those upper frets in. Pulling back just a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. So again I'm kind of flexing that. Kind of over radius it a little bit. That's good. I have this big heavy lead puck. I hold this up against the head brace and that gives me the inertia to be able to tap that fret in. I'm starting here because this is the most precarious portion of the fingerboard to do is the fingerboard extension. I'm right handed so I want to get my right hand to the hammer. I am hammering directly onto the fret in this case. And that big chunk of lead gives us the support and inertia underneath that fingerboard extension to allow us to tap the fret in without cracking the top. So you kind of get it started just kind of pressing it in with my fingers at first here. Okay, this is a one pound dead blow hammer. And because it's plastic, and because it's so big, it doesn't get anywhere near the wood of the fingerboard. It just taps the fret in. Good. So once again, I've got that mark black for base. This is the base side of the fret. Tap that guy in. I want to bring you around this side because I'm using this piece of high density foam as my storyboard. I have the cinch lever for the uh, neck support kind of pushing down to hold it in place against the upper platform. And I've put all those frets into the foam in the order that they came out with the black base side up. So I snap them up and go, no guessing games here. All these frets are going in exactly where they came out. Yeah, this is really soft fret wire. Like I said, the, one of the advantages of that is it's really easy to kind of tap that overhang down when the fret wire is that soft. Yeah, it's good and tight. Beautiful. Now this last fret is directly over the head block, so, so just switch back to the maple dowel for this one. Okay, we'll put our fret guard back on. Oh, incidentally, uh, Will, the 
your fret guards and your fretting kit is on its way. So I'll send the tracking number when I get back into the office. So before we do the edge dress, I'm going to heat that nut and take it out because we're doing a compensated nut. Let's see if this is going to cooperate. Oh, look at that. Oh, nice. That came off nice and clean. Now we can do our edge dress. So now we're going to get, for the last time, for this guitar, we're going to cut those sharp edges while the guitar is dried right out after a Canadian winter. This is the file that you'll get in your kit there, Will. Get this side. Okay, now we're going to check the lay of the neck again. So whether you love it or hate it, this is a historically significant guitar. You can see that truss rod. I would imagine it's a garrison truss rod. So this is kind of thrown together from leftover parts, I guess, the last ditch desperate effort to make Gibson guitars in Newfoundland. Alas, it was never meant to be. The truss rod works perfectly fine. I'm going to back it off just a little bit there. Huh. Looks pretty good. Ready to dress. Now we're ready to recrown. Don't touch the center of the fret with the crowning file. I'm working from the center of the fret to the outside. Now I'll come around to the other side. Because obviously the body is in the way, so you've got to start at the center of the highest part of the radius and move towards the outside. And of course this is just for the fingerboard extension while you're working over top of the body. Here you can go all the way across. So the recrowning is done. So we've got our 400 grit. This takes out all the tooling marks of the leveling file. So. And of course, this is a scrub block that you'll get in your kit there, Will. And it just flexes over those crowns and scrubs them back to center in no time at all. So the other thing I'm doing, I've got a second piece of 400 grit here, is I'm going to get rid of the last little bit of sharpness on those outside edges where we just did our edge dress. Now this is a cloth back 400. I get that from a supplier here in Canada, sandpaper.ca. Check them out online. You can order these. I get these in a 10 foot roll. Finish up with this 400 bit and get rid of the last of those sort of sharp edges. You need cloth back paper to do this. When you try to get rid of these sharp edges, they'll just shred the paper, sandpaper. So you need cloth back. I've got my 600 already loaded, and that is going to take the scratch marks of the 400 out. Second piece of 600. Now I've got my emery cloth. From there, we'll buff it up the canvas wheel. So there's our emery paper. Just about ready to go to the canvas wheel. And we are ready for the canvas wheel. Okay, we'll load this canvas wheel up with some jeweler's root. So a quick word of caution here. When you're buffing those outside edges and you have plastic binding, you do not want to pause when you're buffing. You'll melt that plastic binding. So keep the tool moving. No. 
on the center of the fret it's fine it's just those outside edges you want to keep that tool moving this is about the rate that I polish To almost do those outside edges as a separate operation. I'm doing the lion's share of the fret first and then I'll go over those edges and keep the tool moving at a good clip so that we don't melt that plastic. So with the 40 steel wool, I'm just rubbing off the residue of the jeweler's rouge. The job is basically done. It'll also take any black marks off the nice white binding. Put that as well. it. So now I'm going to come around the other side just to get that uh, residue off in between the frets. We'll bring you in for a good close look in a second. Now if you go easy, you can just scrape the residue off of the white binding and it comes up nice and clean. There's actually stain on this binding from when the guitar was first made, so just kind of very lightly scraping that, bringing it up nice and white. Yeah, that's actually a little bit of lacquer on there actually. Okay. Okay, I'm going to sweep along the fingerboard and just kind of show you exactly what the finished product looks like. I do have a video I posted on doing the Gibson style binding, in other words, creating those nibs that Gibson have, those beautiful plastic nibs that they have on their... Uh, end guitars. They obviously weren't doing it on this guitar. So I'm just kind of making my way up and scraping that nice and white. Like I said, I'll sweep along with the camera and let you see this when it's uh, finished. Okay, quick wipe. Wipe it on, wipe it off. It's just like a lemon oil, no silicone. And kind of wipe that on and put that on and wipe it off. And the fretwork is done. This is definitely not your typical Gibson truss rod. This guitar must have been put together by bits and pieces. It's kind of half Garrison, half Gibson. That's definitely a Garrison truss rod. It's not a Gibson truss rod. So all of those frets were reinstalled. And then I did the fret level, recrown and polish. And we got the action down pretty good on this. 
want to bring you in to show you the bridge saddle. So one good thing about this bridge saddle is I did not have to cantilever. They got the math perfect on this. There was enough in the thickness of the original saddle to intonate all the way across. The saddle that was in there, the one that I took out, wasn't high enough. I've often talked about the six different planes of neck to body angle that need to be taken into consideration when the neck is set to the body. This one the actual neck set is too far back this way. Well, I, I won't say it's too far back, but it is borderline. So for a steel string guitar, the distance from the soundboard surface to the underside of the six string should be somewhere between half inch and five eighths. Five eighths at the max and half inch at least. So this saddle is sort of at the top end. You wouldn't want it to be too much higher. There's plenty to play with to adjust the action, so that won't be an issue. He'll always be able to set this thing up any way he wants. Because of that fall off on the end of the fingerboard on this guitar, I actually went with the 5th fret and corresponding octave instead of the 7th fret and corresponding octave. Because of the fall off, these notes would be sharp. So we switched that up a little bit. Well, it plays great, silky smooth, perfectly in tune, so let's have a listen. Now most seasoned guitar techs that have worked on Gibsons would know that this relief cut for access to the truss rod is, is also not typical Gibson. The truss rod cover is though. It's an authentic Gibson truss rod cover. And the other thing I noticed is the actual dimension, thread, length, and thickness of these truss rod cover screws are not typical Gibson. I know that I'm splitting hairs, but it's really just a point of interest. I'm just pointing it out. I'm not, I'm not complaining. I actually find it kind of intriguing. It's actually quite a thick top, too. Very rigidly braced, which it needs to be with the action that high. And speaking of action, if you remember earlier in the video, this is where the action lies now. And you can see that fall off. We've kind of pushed it further along now, last two, three frets. And this also gives you an idea how high that saddle is. But it's solid. It's not tipping. It's in there. Good press fit. And the system actually sounds pretty good in this guitar. All right, let's go have a listen. Okay, here we go. This is the wrap up. That's our compensated nut. These are 11 to 52 strings of concert pitch. And this is our made in Canada. So we'll just start by doing a quick round robin. Chords. This is the acoustic guitar. I've looped this progression. So I'll let that play.
took um, Will's suggestion and got this airy, what's it called, an airy wave. Yeah, I think it's called airy wave tuner. And, uh, you know, it works pretty good. I mean, I, I'm kind of bouncing still. The jury's not in completely on this one yet, but uh, bouncing back and forth between the clear tune and this new airy wave tuner. Anyway, guitar is tuned, so, uh, so here's another progression. This is, um, and I've looped this, I'll play over this, so this is C minor. So I'll let that play. Mm -hmm. 